Welcome back to the wizard shop. Today we're going to talk about some of the car lingo or some of the key terms that are used in the car world. We're going to help translate that into something you guys can understand. Well, here I sit surrounded by Hoovy's catastrophes. But, but we're going to use them for good today. We're going to use the catastrophes and the pieces and parts that are left over to help educate you guys today. Now this video that we're doing now is not really for those who are mechanical gurus or shop techs or things of that nature. This is for the person who's been to a shop and they say, your rear main seal is leaking. And you're like, I don't even know what that is. I can't even picture what's going on there. Or if you are pretty good at describing that to other people, and you want some help with that, direct them to this video. This helps describe some of the common issues. What's involved with what they just told you is wrong with your car. So you're at the shop, you're getting your car diagnosed or an oil change or whatever, and they walk into the office and they say, hey, your front main seal is leaking all over the place. And you say, I have no idea what you're talking about. This is what they're talking about. This is the main pulley. This is Tyler's old Porsche engine out of Apollo 911. This one pulley powers every other pulley around here. Your, your alternator, your AC, your power steering pump that was up here. There's a seal behind this pulley, which looks like this right here. It's just a little rubber seal. The shaft sits in it. This is off of Tyler's Prius. It would have had a pulley sitting here, just like that one. Behind the pulley, you take the pulley off, and there's a seal right here. It's leaking. It'd be leaking all down the front of the motor. It's not that big of a job. You just take the pulley off, pry the old seal out, and put a new one in. That Behind that is oil. Oil all in the engine, circulating, lubricating chain, timing chains, and things of that nature. When that seal goes bad, the oil is allowed to escape and leave the engine, exit the engine. So that, when they say your front main seal is leaking, it's just that little seal right there. Car wizard, is this something that needs to be fixed right away? Depends on if it's leaving a, a trail all over your driveway. If it's a small leak, no, it doesn't need to be fixed right away. But if it's, you're noticing big leaks or puddles where you park, yeah, you need to get it fixed. It's gonna make a mess everywhere. Is it gonna destroy your engine? eventually when you run out of oil. But other than that, now nah, there's no real trouble. So Car Wizard, what's the difference between the front main seal and a rear main seal? Exactly as it's described, the front main seal is in the front of the engine. The rear main seal is in the rear of the engine and usually requires the transmission to come out of the vehicle to get to the flywheel and remove the flywheel. And there's the rear main seal. I'll show you, let's take a look. So this is the back side of Tyler's Porsche engine. You can see where the transmission used to bolt up. The transmission's been removed and there's the clutch and the flywheel. In order to get to the rear main seal we still have to remove the clutch and the flywheel and when we remove these circular items right here out of the way this is what you're left with. This is Tyler's nitrous Prius escapade that he went on here. The flywheel, that circular object right there, has been removed. You can see where it used to bolt up. And there's a big rubber seal right here. It's a lot bigger than the front one. Usually you can pry that out, lightly tap a new one in. Sometimes there, there's bolts here, you can unbolt an entire assembly kind of a plate. But you replace the seal, you put everything back together. Basically, it's a lot of hours of work for a $10 seal. That's usually what it is. It's just the labor is involved is, can be quite extensive, and it's just the way it is. There's no way around it. So when they say your rear main seal is leaking, it's in the back of your engine. It's usually pouring down onto the ground near the rear of the engine. So there you go. That's your rear main seal. So. You're sitting in the office and the mechanic comes in and says, we have a code for a throttle position sensor is bad. 
maybe you've noticed some symptoms, it's running rough, or when you hit the gas, it uh, doesn't accelerate right, or something along those lines. And you say, okay, uh, that means nothing to me. I don't even know what that is. Well, we're gonna show you. This was the intake and the throttle body off of this engine. Half of it's missing, but the main thing I wanted to show you guys is the th throttle body. When you hit the gas with your feet, this is what happens. A little blade opens and closes. That's it. That's the simplicity of hitting the gas pedal. You floor it, that thing opens up, and a whole bunch of air rushes in, mixes with fuel, and you go faster. How does the computer know that you did that? You just floored it. How does the computer, the computer doesn't have eyes, how does it know that that just opened? Right here, with this throttle position sensor. For every inch that you move this thing, it moves a little wheel inside of here. And through wires, it sends it to the computer, and the computer goes, oh, you just floored it. Okay, I, I'll give some more gas. This little sensor goes bad, and then the computer doesn't know what's going on. It doesn't know that you hit the gas or whatever's happening. It's just a little black box. They're usually not hard to replace. So there's the sensor. Like I just said, it's a little black box with two screws, and there's wires that come out of it that go directly to the computer. It's not this thing I'm holding it. It's just this little flat box right here. It senses for every little bit you open the throttle, it gives a, a value to the computer how much it's been opened. That's all it does. The next thing I wanted to show you is, let's say your throttle body's dirty and we need to clean it. Well, you're like, well, what does that mean? Just like I showed you, this is the blade. When you hit the gas, that opens up. If you look inside of there, there's a black ring, it's dirty. Where that thing closes, right where it touches, look when I open it again, it's black. It's dirty and greasy and gunky. That can affect your idle, your idle speed. So your computer could throw a code that there's an issue with the idle or something of that nature. You just need to clean the throttle body, spray some cleaner. I use an old toothbrush, clean those out. And like new, that's what they're doing when they say, you need to clean your throttle body. They're just cleaning the gunk around that blade. That's it. It's as simple as that. Hey, Car Wizard, you said that it throws a code. What does a code look like? A check engine light. Your little light will come on, and maybe there's an issue. The, the mechanic will look at it and say, oh, I see this code, and very likely they'll know off the top of their head, I'll check the throttle body. It might be dirty. It won't be necessarily a code that you could read and a consumer would know right away what it is. A mechanic would know by reading the codes. The next thing I'm going to show you is that your computer needs to be reprogrammed or you have an issue with your computer in your car. This is all it is. It's a little box with a big connector that goes in. No, it's not a computer like an Apple or a Dell or something that's sitting on your desk. It's really not even much of a computer. A sort of, you're not going to get on Google with this thing or YouTube or the Internet. It's not a computer like you're thinking. All it does is take information coming in and gives a result coming out. That's it. It's really not very smart. It's just it responds to things coming in. It gives a pre-programmed output after that. So this is basically all a computer is. And you're driving along and you see your check engine light. Where did the check engine light come from? What told it to come on? This did. It's receiving information coming in, and it says, okay, I'm reading an auction sensor. It should be from this to this, but it's not. Something's wrong. Okay, I'm turning on the light. Turn on the check engine light. When you clear the codes, you're clearing the little brain inside of here. You're clearing this. This is what you're clearing. So you say, well, check engine light, what, where did that come from? It comes directly from your, some people call it an ECM, electronic control module, or PCM, powertrain control module, or just simply computer. It's basically just a miniature little computer. So now when someone talks about your computer, this or that, you can picture this in your head. This is what it is. And when your check engine light comes on, it came from this thing. This thing turned it on for you. Hey, Car Wizard, 
when the computer needs to be reprogrammed, is it just like a firmware update? Yeah. The little diagnostic connector under your dash, there's a couple of wires that are used there to co communicate with this computer. And maybe there's some updates or some information they need to change inside of that computer. They do it through the, it's like a firmware update, basically. Maybe you guys remember the old TomTom Tom GPS you have on your dash, and there's a firmware update. All they're updating is the hard coding inside. There's no hard drive in here. There's no floppy disk. There's no USB drive. It's just little chips and electronics inside of here that can be firmware updated back and forth. So that's what they mean when they're going to flash your computer or upgrade it or update it, update the firmware. So that's it for the computer. The next things I'm going to show you, there's, this is like kind of a two for one. Number one, your auction sensor is bad. Okay, where is, I don't even know where that thing is. Where is it located? It's located on your exhaust pipes. There's one here, one here. There's usually four on a two-sided engine, or if it's a four-cylinder, there'll only be two. But there's two more here. And they'll say there's upstream and downstream, or before the cat or after the cat, which is catalytic converter. So as you can see, this, this one here sits before the cat, so the exhaust is flowing through this pipe. It comes into this chamber. It's been measured by this one. That tells the computer it needs to add more fuel or take away fuel to make the mixture just right. Now, is your catalytic converter working? Is it cleaning up the exhaust like it's supposed to, mandated by the government? How does the computer know if it is or not? There's a second oxygen sensor after the cat. All it does is sit there and just measure the exhaust. And when it reaches a certain parameter outside a certain limit, it says, your cats are bad. So they come into the office and they say, you're, you've got a catalyst inefficiency code and your cats are bad. Okay, what does that mean? That means they're no longer cleaning the exhaust like they should, as well as they should. And the computer was able to tell using this little sensor. When you come out of the cat, it follows along. And there's the sensor after the cat. Now when they say your catalytic converters are bad, this is what these big chambers are. Inside of there is like a ceramic material with platinum or different metals inside. It gets really, really hot and, and burns the rest of the fuel and contaminants and things out of the exhaust and basically just scrubs the exhaust and cleans it. And as you can see, like on this car, you can't just hack, cut it out and hack it out. There's no room to even do it. You would buy the entire pre-made, pre-welded. You would take these bolts loose here and take them loose. Take the exhaust loose underneath. You can see there's nothing there now. And you would buy this entire piece. Pre-made, pre-welded, pre-done. That's why they're so expensive. You say, oh my goodness, it's going to be $1,500 for my catalytic converter? Very likely, six or seven hundred of that, or more, is just this piece. Some of the older cars, you just buy this little piece here and weld it into your pipes. That, there's no room to weld anything in here. You have to replace the whole thing. So they say your cats are bad. That's what it is, this chamber that sits in, your, in line with your exhaust pipes. That's all it is. So they come into the office and they say your AC compressor is locked up. And you're like, okay, well, that probably means I have no more air conditioning. But outside of that, I don't know what in the world you're talking about. These are a couple of different AC compressors. They're to come in different shapes and sizes based on the engine they came off of. But this one came off of Tyler's Porsche. This one you would typically see on Chevy's GM products. But the pulley that the belt rides on spins free. It doesn't do anything but just spin until you turn your AC on. And there's a little clutch here. You hear that? It can engage or disengage. There's two wires that come into these two contacts here. And when you apply power to them, it engages. And the whole thing now turns. Not just the freewheel pulley. 
the entire thing burns, which now compresses the refrigerant in here. Now when they say your compressor's locked up, the belt portion probably still spins fine, but when you try to engage it, it's locked up inside of here. So it just, it'll scree screech and make noises and it can't physically turn the compressor itself. So that's what they mean when your compressor is locked up. Can you live with that broken air conditioning compressor? Yeah, just like I just showed you. It spins just fine. Your belt's not gonna fly off. It's only gonna be a problem when you try to turn on the AC and it engages. And this is locked up inside of here. Now it's gonna screech and squeal. It may throw your belt at that point. If you don't turn on your AC, you'll more than likely be fine. So they come into the office and they tell you some really bad news. They say your head gasket is blown. And you're like, okay, I've heard of that before. I know it's expensive, super expensive. But what is a head gasket? Where, where is it on the engine and what does it do? Well, this is the old Prius engine off of, again, off of Tyler's nitrous escapade he went on. But this is the front of the engine. And basically it's in two halves, a top half and a bottom half. When the head gasket goes bad, I'll show you why or what that is in a minute, but the first part I'm gonna tell you is how do they get to it? They have to take all the accessories off, the timing chains out, the camshafts which sit on top of here out to get these bolts, head bolts is what they're called. And once they get these long head bolts out, they can pull the head off just like that. So we're gonna turn this upside down so you can see. In these little circles, it's called the cylinders, that's where the magic happens and makes your car go. It sprays gas in there, the little spark plugs here spark and ignites and makes your engine go. I'm not gonna go into that too much. But what's going on inside of these circles has to stay inside of those circles. As you can see, there's all these little holes. That's where antifreeze goes. It flows through these holes and keeps your engine cool. Otherwise, it would just overheat and cook itself and it would lock up. The coolant that flows through these holes also, you can see all the holes corresponding in the cylinder head. It also goes up inside the cylinder head and keeps that cool as well. So just like I said a minute ago, your antifreeze that's in these holes and what's going inside of these circles, what's going on there, should never mingle. They should never be together. But when these head gaskets blow, which is what this is, just a little gasket, when these blow, the coolant is allowed to flow past here and into the combustion chamber, or vice versa, pressure pushes into the coolant chambers and it causes you can, like an antifreeze blowout. It can blow antifreeze all over the highway, overheat your engine. Let me set this aside. This is the head gasket. This is actually the gasket that's blown. This is what they're replacing. This is what's gone bad. So as you can see, coolant flows in these ring, this track, I guess it looks like, around here. There's antifreeze full in here. There's no air in here. It's completely filled with antifreeze. The antifreeze cannot be allowed to get into this circle, nor can the exhaust and gases things be allowed to get into the antifreeze. They have to be separated, and that's what that gasket does. Like I said a minute ago, the gasket blows and allows stuff to transfer back and forth that shouldn't. If you've got your engine overheating, and your heater stops working, that's because it's getting filled with bubbles all in the coolant. It's pressing air past the gasket and into your antifreeze. Then the bubbles go through the cooling system, through the radiator, and into your heater core. Usually they end up in your heater core because it's the highest point. Your heater doesn't work and your engine's overheating. Maybe there's antifreeze all over the highway. Very likely could have just blown a head gasket. And it may be that they can check and indicate and find that that's going on before you have major symptoms like that. 
in the reservoir, they could take the cap off, and there's oily gunk inside of there. It's coming from the cylinders into the coolant. The thing is, is if you notice these symptoms while you're traveling, you don't want to keep driving, because what happens is you overheat your engine, and that warps this cylinder head. This flat surface right here has to be perfectly flat. If it's not, then when you put your head gasket on and you try to bolt this thing back down, it doesn't seat flat and it'll just blow the head gasket again and again and again. So Car Wizard, how do you get it perfectly flat? If it's been overheated, and usually I do this anyway just for preventative measure, you take the cylinder head to a machine shop and they have a fixture that fixes it in there perfectly flat and then they have a big tur a head that cuts and it comes along and shaves just a couple three thousandths of not very much like the thickness of a human hair maybe a little more and shaves that flat completely flat again then you can put everything back together usually the blocks not warped it can but usually that's not the case. Is that because they're made of different metals? No, these is, this is aluminum and this is aluminum. But there are engines that this is iron, cast iron, and that's aluminum. That can be an issue too, but usually it's not. A lot of LS-based truck motors, the Vortex, have cast iron blocks, aluminum heads. They don't have that, have any issues. So when they come into the office and say you have a blown head gasket, now you can picture in your head, this is what's blown. It's metal, usually. This is your issue. And the last thing I'm going to say is a common issue. They come into the office and they say, ma'am, sir, or whoever, your valve cover gaskets are leaking. Usually you'll see a mess all down the side of the motor, or maybe even smell oil, burning oil smell under the in under the hood. This is the valve cover. All it does is sit on top of the cylinder head, like so. It's just a cover, just what it says, a valve cover. It covers, it keeps dirt out, keeps the oil clean, keeps oil from spraying everywhere. There's a little rubber gasket that goes between these two that keeps everything nice and tight and sealed up. When it goes bad, they have to usually take the ignition coils out, usually not a whole lot, take this off, and you can see a channel where there was a rubber gasket here at one time. They just pull it out and put a new one on, new little gaskets here, and they put it back together. Didn't you do a video of that on your LS truck? Yes, you can go back to that video and watch. I pull the valve cover off and put a new gasket on. It's the same procedure on just about any car. Is this one you have to do right away? Um, if it's leaking really bad, it actually could catch fire if it's leaking on a catalytic converter or something. But if it's just a slight seepage, no, you don't have to do it right away. You can wait a little while and It'll just be a nuisance. It'll get worse and you'll start smelling when you're at a red light. AC or your heater's sucking in outside air. It's going to suck in that oil burning smell. You'll smell it in your cab and you'll be like, you know what, I'm tired of smelling that. I've got to get my car in the shop and get this fixed. So that's typically what's going on with your valve cover gasket. Well, I hope that helps you guys out. Some of you that have been to mechanic shops and you're like, I don't even know what in the world they're talking about. We'll do another one or two of these videos with various other parts of the car and show you exactly this is what they're talking about when they say this is bad or that's bad. So if you know some people that are having some issues with their car or they just got a diagnosis from the mechanic and they're like, what is, I don't even know what that is, S send them a link to this video, share this video, show it to your friends, and then maybe it'll help them get an understanding of what's exactly going on with their car. So if there's any tools that I've used in the past or any tools you're interested in seeing, what kind of tools do I use? Check my Amazon affiliates page. They're all listed there and you can purchase them there. We also have hats and hoodies and shirts and things for sale. You can check that out too in the link below. And like I said, we'll do this again. We'll show some more videos like this. And thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.